going to need somebody to be me. Who wants to be me? Out there. I mean, I'm going to be sitting. You're going to be presenting. Somebody has to sit. <coughs> Tori's going to be me? I guess. Okay. You have to tell me when 10 minutes is Oh, I see that. And what you have to do is say it loudly enough so I hear it. And I'm kind of hard of hearing it. So. Can you practice for me now? Say 10 minutes. 10 minutes. That's good. Okay. That's me. So when I say that to you, don't get all flustered and go like, oh my God, it's 10 minutes. It's just a, a signal to let you know that I should be wrapping it up, okay? You're going to have another additional two minutes after that to truly wrap up before I shut you down. So I have a fail-safe point. A fail-safe point. When I say 10 minutes, then you know you can get whatever that ending note is that you want to finish your presentation. You've got two minutes to do that. So if you practice well, what you'll know is exactly what you're going to do when I say 10 minutes. If you're not to 10 minutes yet, you've got two more minutes to finish up. Did I say that right? <coughs> presentation is not going to go well. <laughs> so, you think about this. Mm -hmm. And probably should have at least looked at the slides, huh? <laughs> okay, I think I know what Alright, sorry. <coughs> okay, I'm going to talk about class wide peer tutoring. It's actually an article by Greenwood, uh, Party, and Hall. Uh, the article is called Longitudinal Effects of Class Wide Peer Tutoring in the Journal of Education. It was uh, published in uh, 1989. Okay, the essence of it was the idea of can classroom processes in the educational uh, context, can they lead to a change in student academic achievement is the basic point. There's a lot of empirical uh, and theoretical support for process advantages. <coughs> of course, we know that teachers' behaviors and their functions in the classroom lead to, we think, lead to um, uh, student change and there's a lot of literature to back that up. Um, there is uh, this idea of direct instructions. Teachers give their one-to-one -one instructions so the students can get better at what they do. And typically what they do is try to teach up to students' mastery of a specific kind of ability or, or skill. And then they move on. So there's support for that as lending to better academic achievement. There's also cooperative learning strategies that they've tried. You have like class um, task, group task, and you have peer tutoring sometimes where uh, peers teach students teach each other. Now the idea of empirical and theoretical support for at-risk factors, in other words, poverty we know, uh, parent low level of education leads to less of an advantage in academic achievement. And also in these kinds of classrooms there's low classroom orientation in the academic class. Typically in these kinds of uh, classes there's as much as 11 minutes less of academic work than in a, a non-poverty type of classroom. So Greenwood, what he was doing, he's trying to in, in, have the strategy of class-wide peer tutoring where in the process of, of low economic classes, what they do is they get together one-to-one, -to -one, these dyads of, of uh, a tutor and 2D, they get together and they go through classroom instruction with each other so they can respond to each other in different ways. The idea is that when they do this, they're competing for points and rec recognition of different kinds to motivate their behaviors. The teachers have to organize the sessions. There's different kinds of content for math, reading, spelling, provide materials, implement. And the intended purpose isn't about teaching, it's about maximizing the student's ability to respond. In other words, it's not about getting it right or wrong, it's that they're actually able to answer and think about things. Just to apply it to what we talk about here, the idea of getting it wrong first so you get it right later is more important than just sitting there and listening to someone instruct. So this investigation extended previous work. Greenwood had done this before in just smaller, not longitudinal uh, studies, whatever. And they also would have extended across both low and high uh, socioeconomic status. Before they were just working with low, and somebody come up and some criticized and said, well, what does this do for high SES as well? So they wanted to look at that. Plus, they wanted to think about these classroom processes that are going, not just the academic achievement outcome, but how do you actually think about the structure going on in the classroom? So they look at these processes, and not just overall academic achievement, but three different academic outcomes. Now this is the design of the experiment. It was in Kansas City, Missouri, where it was run. It started off with all schools from 35 schools. They tried to just randomly select schools from there. What happened was a lot of schools declined, because think about it, the teachers were going to have to construct their own coursework in class wire peer tutoring. It wasn't like it was already given to them pre uh, pre-made, pre-constructed so they could actually do the classes. They chose six low SES, and then they chose three high SES. They were all randomly selected. And if 
that they agreed they were randomly selected. There were more than the selected, but not everyone agreed that they could be part of it, right? Now, what happened was these particular, uh, part of it was the CWPT, that'll represent class-wide peer tutoring sessions. That was in four low SES schools, and those were all uh, randomly assigned block. Two of them were not given that CWPT treatment, all right, or training for the teachers, if you will. Randomly blocked, meaning that they wanted to maximize the ones that were getting the treatment as opposed to the ones that were not. They also wanted to compare it to, these were not CWPT, they wanted to compare it to the high SES because the idea is that socioeconomic uh, status, high SES, lends to greater uh, academic achievement anyway. So they just wanted to compare and see if this could compete with this, because normally, though, you know, these are depressed as far as their, their scores. There was not equivalence in the, the kinds of uh, makeup of the samples. When we think about how the comparison actually works, the quasi-experimental differences between these, what we know is that in the high SES, there was not equivalent proportion of minority in the group. 2% minority compared to, uh, what was it, 85% in the, the low SES. So really different kind of composition here, and they were not comparable in that way. The gender, however, was comparable. What we know is that across the time, grades one through four, which was the length of this particular longitudinal study, there were 94 different teachers. And when you think about this, this is creating a lot of different noise. It's not the same, it's not the same person creating the same kind of task, but 94 different teachers across time giving them these kinds of uh, CWP treatment. They had to come up with their own class plans to implement these. As an introductory pre-measure, what they had was the Otis Limit School Abilities Test. This was like math, reading skills, spelling, this kind of stuff. Basically, they also took pre-measures of parent SES, and they did this intelligence achievement test score here as well. What they had was then, after four years, they came back to look at the compliance of influence, uh, influence in, in the classroom between the different teachers. You can imagine with 94 different teachers, it was very, very different levels of compliance across time. You would think in your mind, like the Lots of noise, maybe lowering the ability to find differences, right? So if we find any differences, that's pretty impressive. That would mean that the effect size is pretty large. Would you think? And so these covariates were all brought in as, as uh, uh, like your main code, if you will. They were covariates that put into the <coughs> these beginning ideas here. We still have these same groups. High, uh, low SES with, with CWPT, just the low SES without CWPT, and the high SES comparison group. And the teachers used their own instrument, their own practices. Everything they normally did in the classroom was exactly the same as they normally do, except for the CWPT teachers who constructed these classroom uh, strategies, these little tutor 2D dyads where they would uh, compete with boards and stuff. At the end, of course, we had like several different tests. Did an overall man code, just like you've done in your simulated data. They followed up with the an code for all the different dependent variables. There were multiple dependent variables. It was very confusing to read this article. There were many, many tables. Very, very hard to read and figure out what they were trying to say. I got that a lot was going on. I got that there were a lot of changes. It wasn't making a lot of sense to me. Very confusing. I think they could have done a better job of this. We did individual t-tests to, to finish up to get individual comparisons of different processes and outcomes. All these things were going on. In other words, multiple dependent variables. Uh, reading, spelling, math, all these processes in the classroom. And I just sort of dumbed it down to myself and just to kind of explain it instead of having all those different tables I'm going to show you. I just have some color-coded things about how they, what things turned out. As far as the processes, they studied things like classroom like ecology, non-academic tasks, the tasks that have to do with the workbooks and that kind of stuff, the actual structure of the classroom, whether in whole groups or small groups or individual things. They had teacher behaviors that were part of the uh, study that they did. When they looked at the behaviors of the students, they had academic responding, whether they were actually responding in class or not. They had um, all that hand, like raising hands and that kind of stuff. And then, of course, they measured the products in the end, like math, reading, and spelling. So the idea is that when the non-academic task, there wasn't a significant difference. The low, if you look at the color code here, I've got, this is CWPT, this is the non-CWPT, those are both low SES versus the high SES. This, the no, the no CWPT Low SES, I think I'll just refer to them as a low SES from now on. And CWPT is a CWPT, which is still low SES. They were significantly had more arts and crafts, business and transitions going on in those kinds of groups, so the, the low SES. What they had is workbooks, worksheets, media, and discussion were much higher than the low SES in both the high SES and the CWPT groups. And the structure of having entire groups or small groups, they were all basically equivalent. There was no significant think about teacher behavior, what we had was 
the CWP team was kind of in between, but significantly different. There was a lot more approval in the, uh, from teachers in the high SES, and a lot more disapproval behaviors from the teachers toward the students in the low SES. You think about student behaviors, what we had was here is the academic responding, like for reading, writing, and, and discussion, uh, significantly <coughs> higher in, um, in both the high SES and the CWP team. And just raising your hand and not getting recognized, there was a lot of that in the low SES groups, okay? And the products, when you think about reading, the math, reading, and spelling, what we had at the highest, they were all significantly different, I should say that. The best results were in the high SES, the next best results were in the CWPT, and the last results, the, the least uh, beneficial were, of course, the low SES. This indicates that CWPT did not raise low SES to the levels of the high SES, but it did move in that direction, okay? So, conclusions from the author. CWPT produces important changes in classroom processes that lead to gains in, in academic improvement. They noted that there was a high attrition rate, in other words, mortality confound, in the low SES groups, but this is not surprising. They explained it by saying that what, what it is is that in low SES uh, classrooms or populations, people tend to leave, move to get... 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Louder. 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so the idea is that... So I've got two minutes now. Don't do that. High attrition because mortality, mortality compound, right? So the reason is, is that they need to move to get jobs. They need to move in with someone else because they can't make rent. So there's a lot of attrition in these. There was uneven implementation of CWPT. They recognized that. But think about it. That just means there's more noise. It's so lower power. So but they still got stuff. Lack of understanding about the differential effects of the separate components of CWPT. So the idea of components is, is like reward, sitting together, uh, the task, uh, who was actually doing the tutor, 2D kind of combinations here. All these internal things to CWPT still have not been studied in this particular study as well. And then this idea of the last year of the study, the fourth year, they ran out of money. Whoops. Uh, lack of measurement of compliance in the last year. But they got a lot of that already measured in the first three years. What I think is that the relationship of the processes to products was not tested. They did it uh, parallel analyses. They showed that there was a change in processes. They showed that there was a change in academic outcome. They did not relate the two to each other in the study. Very big problem for me. I looked at that and I thought, okay, you got these parallel and I get it, you think they're changing together, but what is the point of that? Uh, it could have been done with what we call structural equation technique, but they did not use that. Not all the comparisons were clearly identified. I'm telling you, the tables are just a mess. They were hard. How about easy on the eyes? How about not easy on the eyes? They were easy on the eyes. Also, it's not clear to me that the class-wide peer tutoring was what made the change. I'm thinking the training of the teachers, maybe they brought, you notice that when there was this behaviors that they were more like the high SES in, the, in their approval behaviors. Maybe just going to the training about creating these different groups changed their, their sense of how they react with or they interact with their students. Maybe something happened there. It had nothing to do with CWPT and the kids. It was more like what CWPT did to the teachers. That's it. And then I would say, <laughs> thank you. The thing that didn't happen was I should have given you a sheet of, uh, about the main points of the study at, before I started the presentation. You should do that. You should have enough to hand out to everyone. You're going to need about 35 copies. Going to hand those out. It's going to have all the main points that we're going to talk. You need to go a lot closer. I'll figure that out. What you want to put on there. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to, at this point, at the end of my presentation, I would ask for questions. And whoever had read the article critique was supposed to ask questions will now be supposed to be asking questions. And you would have 10 minutes to ask questions. Okay? But nobody read my article, so I'm let off the hook. It's actually one of the most fun things. You're going to have to think on your feet, both as the questioner and as the person answering the presentation. You don't know what questions are going to be. And those of you who are getting ready to ask the questions, you don't know what questions you need to ask until you hear the presentation. Because you don't want to ask the questions they've already given you the information about. You've got to ask something that they didn't give you the information about. Otherwise, you're just you know, asking questions. Everybody knows the answer to all those questions.